Welcome to the Momentum webinar series, where we ask expert facilitators to weigh in on topics that help advance women in leadership. All right, welcome. <laughs> We're about to get started here with Delphine Carter today. We're so excited to have her. And we do want to um, ask you that if you haven't already muted, if you would, so you can hear her. However, we do have the chat open and we would love to hear from you throughout all of this. Um, any questions that you have or comments as we're going through all of this today. Um, Delphine has been uh, a phenomenal force for women and we're so grateful for everything that she has done. She is the founder of Bulo um, and she has taken all of her expertise that she has learned in the past and the frustration she had of trying to connect the right um, the, the right businesses with the right people, people who had skill sets. And she has carved out a niche that has been phenomenal for women. And we thank you for all that you've done, Delphine, and that you're continuing to do. And today she's going to share with us of how you um, can carry other women with you as you climb and as you grow to don't don't do this alone. You do not have to do any of this alone. And if you want to see more women around the table, you need to bring them up in the ranks. And she's got some great tips and thoughts and um, a lot of experience of what she has learned uh, through all of her um, her strategizing, everything that she's learned in all her companies in the past. So Delphine, thank you so much for joining us today. That's so great to be here and um, really thankful that you guys had me. And so I will get started to share my screen. Okay, so thanks again for joining me. I'm sure everybody can see this for Carrie's You Climb. And this has become um, even more of a topic lately. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright really brought it um, in a very aggressive way in her keynote speech at the WNBA celebration. This was in 2006. And she said, there's a very special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Now, again, that's in a very aggressive way of saying things, but that quote was so stark and caught so many pieces of people's attention that it's been repeated by hundreds of women around the world, including heads of state, celebrities, and again, while clearly aggressive, it shows the collective shift in the wine, in the mindset that's happening for many women. First, we've got to acknowledge that we all have bias. There is a new uh, UN report that found 90% of men and women hold some sort of bias against females. I have bias. Many of you may have bias. Well, you just all do have bias. We just have to figure out what we're by what our biases are. So do you support women in your profession or could some unconscious bias be subtly interfering? When a woman's name was replaced by a man's name on a resume, evaluators were 60% more likely to say that they would hire the applicant. When hiring managers believed that a woman had children because they saw PTA or Parent Teacher Association on her resume, she was 79% less likely to be hired than if she was hired. She was giving about 11,000 on average less than salary. Now, since 70.3% of human resource managers are women, there's a disconnect, right? What, what does this tell us? So confession on myself, I took a test on gender bias um, about a year ago, and it showed that I had a bias regarding women and ties to motherhood, being a wife versus career traits. I was born in the 70s. So, so there was messages that were being sent to me as I grew up that clearly I absorbed much more than I ever thought. So I have a bias and I built an entire business assuming that I didn't have that bias. So it's a really interesting thing when you can confront it. Now I can either hide that I found out I have bias or I can look at it squarely in the eye and try to fix it. So we'll cover ways to figure out if you have bias and then how overcoming that bias with just some subtle behavior shifts will help all of us reach our career go goals. Women alone have power, women together have impact. And I know just as being part of momentum that you guys feel the same way. So I don't know how many of you ever saw Heather's. That was a big movie for us when we were growing up. But they really, um, they were very, the whole message was about the mean girl 
trope. So we're all familiar with the mean girl trope. Studies have been done about how women relate to women only starting the 80s. It had been done with men forever, but they really just had never bothered to do it for women. So research showed that girls exhibit relational aggression to establish or maintain their social status. This is the quintessential mean girl. She is fundamentally motivated by status and social hierarchy, whether that's gaining it or maintaining that capital that she already has. That's the standard definition of the mean girl. She's typically confident, ambitious, I would argue false confidence potentially, um, ambitious, cunning, and she'll use these straight traits to uphold power and manipulate others, thereby keeping her as a leader. I've got a 13-year-old girl, eighth grade. Um, we have this conversation a lot because it seems like every school's got them. There are so many movies that highlight the mean girl. We hear about it in our children's schools, and we may have experienced it ourselves growing up or to this day in our office spaces, which I think more of us have than... Um, than really we should. So the mean girl is clearly an extreme example. There are much more subtle examples, not quite as obvious, have the same effect of trying to keep people um, in an in a unstable state. You try to keep the other woman at a lower status than your own, whether you're thinking about it or not. So we'll talk about why um, we even have this relational aggression um, in a second. So think about yourselves. Try to answer these questions. Do you aggressively judge other women for choices that you wouldn't personally make? Remember that judging is very different from disagreeing. We don't have to all agree with each other's choices, but judging is a very different place in our brains and how we handle it. Do you criticize women for minor transgressions, but you tend to forgive men because you've used to forgiving men for these behaviors. I know we have allies probably on the webinar. Momentum has always been great about bringing in male allies. So I do wanna honor that. And then do you sometimes make excuses for men's behavior as that's just the way it is? Do you also compete more than you collaborate with your female colleagues? And we'll talk about healthy competition versus unhealthy. Professional success often requires qualities that are traditionally associated with masculinity. Look at these two pictures. Masculinity, decisive, confident, competitive, direct. Those are qualities for professional success that I think we all agree are handy. But women cannot succeed with those traits. Both genders, men and women, will ding women for being too confident, too direct. There's a recent study that showed that when women mimic the non-traditional gender behaviors, they experience backlash. So for women to achieve any influence, they need to be decisive, confident, competent, direct, and warm, trustworthy, friendly, and likable. So we just added like four more traits that we have to have in order to be successful. When women aren't warm, we're seen as um, aggressive and difficult. But if we're only seen as warm, then we're not taken seriously. For some reason, for some women, the very last thing where they work that they ever want to be called is nice. So in Shutterstock, I searched confident professional older woman and confident professional older man. And these are the two images I got. She's looking soft and sweet. She almost looks like the high school, you know, little graduation picture. But this is what Shutterstock, which is one of the largest photo houses, um, responds with when I type that in. This double bind means it's really difficult to achieve success if we don't recognize um, what's going on. So here are 30 characteristics that are used against women at work. I've highlighted the ones that I personally thought disproportionately affected women. The pattern of unconscious bias against women has major comp Con, um, consequences in how we are treated at work. Unlike men, women are off, often evaluated on our achievements rather than potential. So what can you do? What have you already done? Hiring committees will say that a female employee needs more experience before she can advance in her next career, while the gentleman in the cubicle next to her has demonstrated leadership potential and has earned the new role. 
pregnancy and motherhood is also women where women's careers stall out and they lose approximately $8,000 per year after their first child. People in the office could say, Betsy has a newborn. She probably can't take on that new project. She really needs some more time to get back into the swing of things. But the message here is that a person's capacity is not for us to decide. These challenges are particularly acute for women of color who often face additional biases. Women of color are consistently shown to be more ambitious than their white peers, but are more likely to feel stalled in their careers. When a woman makes a mistake, it's more likely to be noticed. Um, a woman of color makes a mistake, it's more likely to be noticed and remembered longer and judged more harshly for that error. Here's another thought. Only 2% of venture funding goes to women founders. I just got done fundraising um, through venture funds and studies show, I knew this going into it, that women pitching their businesses get more questions about what could go wrong and men get more questions about the opportunity. Tell me the market share you could get. Tell me how big this could get. So that's really tough for me to notice happening and I think maybe my idea or my expertise or my execution could be off when I'm getting those questions, right? Like we're not thinking about this bias that's coming to the table already. We're, we're get being hard on ourselves. But when you start comparing to other companies who get more funding or second round funding, you can start realizing that there's more to the story. Women specifically engage in what we just talked about is relational aggression. Relational aggression is defined, it's a type of aggression that is intended to harm others through deliberate manipulation of their social standing and their relationships. So here are examples of what that looks like in real life, um, excluding intentionally. So maybe you specifically want a small group to go to lunch, leaving some other people out, spreading rumors, sometimes embellished rumors, maybe not the full story, the full truth, um, making derogatory comments, breaking confidences. If somebody tells you they're feeling vulnerable about a project or they are uncertain about something, sharing those confidences with others. Um, a big one is group shaming, saying things at a table, like uh, especially at a decision-making table, oh, you're too young to know better. You haven't experienced that. Or you're older, you wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Or even saying, she needs to leave at 5, 8, 5 p.m. Let me take care of it. So these are things that on their heads don't sound aggressive, but they do tend to make the other person feel weaker. The studies are really only 40 years old for why we do this, but this is their assumptions for why. First, men judged each other just as harshly as men do. That's what all the studies show. So I'm not saying that we're worse than men. All I'm saying is that we do things we should be aware of in order to help all of us reach pay parity and leadership roles. So there's more women at the table. So girls are often social oh, from a young yeah. age through observing other women to compete indirectly. Um, am I as cute as she is? Is my outfit better on me than it is on her? This creates rivalries and conflicts that are harder to resolve and less likely to fade over time because we aren't trained to address things directly. When women speak up, or articulate their views and ideas in a confident way, likability comes at risk in our peer groups. And so we can be negatively labeled. Um, so we started adopting some more passive confrontation methods like gossip and sarcasm and more passive aggressive traits to boost our status. All of this is because many of us have been put in a place where we have a scarcity mindset. The competition back, think eons ago, forever, forever, forever ago, Bible ages, competition to survive and reproduce is really fundamental to understanding why we biologically adapted. In a study conducted about female relationships by a Harvard professor, they laid out this history. Men relied, and they still do, on women to carry out their lineage. It was very important, especially eons ago. The men also had to trust that their wives were not in multiple relationships because they had no way of knowing if that child was theirs. So in order to, to handle that, 
they started speaking negatively about female behavior that tended to attract attention because that could potentially draw another man in. The less that a woman shined, the better it was to ensure the lineage. Now, women relied on men to provide safety and security, help keep their children alive and with financial future, eating, land. And so women soon saw other women as competition for their partner and for their child security. So women started saying negative things about a woman's attire or their behavior because they wanted to be sure that their partner saw them as more pure and to diffuse the threat of these other women. They wanted to get these flashier women out of their community. But women also needed to rely on each other in the community because men were often gone. And so the women were encouraged to complete a lot of tasks in groups. So imagine what that's like. You're trying to push people away, but you're also saying, I need you. Every woman was a threat and also a support system. And that's super difficult to balance. And that's the history of why women found relational aggression as means of staying secure. It was 1974 before laws said that you can't give me a mortgage uh, just because I'm single. So I was one years old, one year old in 1974. It wasn't that long ago. So all of us should consider how we have been trained to think about these relational behaviors. The good news is, is that we don't have to do this anymore. 45% of families have women who are equal or primary breadwinner. We do not rely on men personally like we used to. If you get a divorce, you can still buy a house, get credit cards, and safely stand on your own. It is harder, but you can. And so we don't have to ostracize each other in order to feel safe. In fact, growing our communities back together to where we are encouraging each other and helping complete tasks together really makes us stronger. So here is how we can do that. Women alone have power. Collectively, we have impact. So coming from a place of scarcity and insecurity, recognize that as your kryptonite. When we stop supporting each other is when we will, um, we stop making progress. The truth is that raising each other up and channeling that power of collaboration is really how we'll change the equation. But we'll also have a lot more fun getting there along the way. It just has, it does have to be more than mentoring. Women, especially women of color, are over mentored and under sponsored. So we're going to talk a lot about sponsorship. Make the unconscious conscious. For an example, you're in a meeting and another woman says something. A gentleman will respond, but they're not looking at her when they respond. They're talking to the other men at the table. What about finding one of the men at the table who's an ally, who you know would really hear what you're saying and asking them to be intentional about speaking directly to the women in the room. Have him start guiding the other men into the behavior um, of speaking to everybody at the table, not just the men. How about your own behavior? When you walk into a meeting, don't take the fringe seats. I was in a meeting the other day where women said they would sit in the seats that were around the table, sit in the middle, take the seats that are smack in the middle of the table, save a seat for another woman who's coming at that same middle spot. Do not also make assumptions of what a woman's career goals are or of their capacity because of age or maternal status that perpetuates some of those um, unconscious biases. I will say this, Gen Zs are much more conscious about what to us is unconscious. There are behaviors that many of us have just accepted as the way things are. It's how we grew into our careers, but for many of them, they don't. So when somebody who is Gen Z complains about something, stop and think, I've been dealing with that for years, but was it ever really right that we had to deal with it to begin with? So before you dismiss them, you want to say, buck up, buttercup, listen and consider what they're saying. There's a big difference between buck up, buttercup and being an engine for change.
another one. So like I mentioned earlier, don't make yourself invisible. We've all talked about, I know you guys have had this training through momentum, big posture, taking up the room. This is the same thing. Sit in the main seats, wherever you are, ask to speak at company all hands, at team meetings, customer presentations, and better yet, nominate another woman who would be great at it. Be very sure to not say yes to everything that you are asked to do because what you are really good at will end up suffering. There's a tomato plant theory where there's one person who's grown this gorgeous tomato plant, beautiful tomatoes. And so they keep giving her more seeds to grow more tomatoes. And eventually all the tomatoes rot because she cannot handle everything that's been put on her plate. So don't feel like you have to say yes to everything because in the end, you will definitely suffer. Also, don't feel like you're the one that has to do the traditional women's work. There's been a lot of discussion about this. In smaller businesses, everyone has to wear multiple hats. So we definitely have to take things on that aren't in our like standard job description, but make sure it's a hat you want to wear. Ask me to plan an event is a horrible idea. And so uh, I would often say, Joe is much better at event planning. He knows all the right people. He's got these great connections. Why don't you go ask him? I'll take on something else. So just be very confident about the hat that you want to wear and then redirect to somebody else the ones that you're not good at. Don't feel forced to wear a hat. Find allies and be an ally. These allies are the ones that help get women to the top. So this person could be a sponsor. Allies can be men or women. They are very important for everyone, especially those that are trying to advance in industries where the rules of success are often unwritten. In many situations, think about male colleagues talking exclusively to other men during meetings like we just went through. It really helps to find an ally. Um, there's a book that just came out that I heard about. It's about scientists in the 70s at MIT that were women, and it's called The Exceptions. Exceptions. And these women started noticing that their lab space was smaller. And they decided to start measuring their lab spaces compared to the men's, but they didn't do anything about it. The only time that they started trying to make change about it was when they realized that their studies were being sacrificed. Something that was very important to them was, was failing because they didn't have enough space to run their studies. So they turned to internal allies at MIT. At one point, a lawyer reached out to them and said, would you like to sue? You've got grounds to sue. What they decided was to use their allies and their voices to start implementing change, which was incredibly important for them. It also was key in making things happen faster. So being an ally as a woman looks like building other women up. If you see a coworker doing a great job, give them credit. Tell your boss, tell other coworkers. You are showing that you're a supportive team player as well as an inspiring leader. And what's really weird that starts happening, and I've seen it, and when I do it is when I compliment somebody, um, a female that I'm newly acquainted with, or maybe they don't know me quite as well, pe women often look a little taken aback. Like, is there a greater strategy? What are you trying to get to? And it just goes to show how, um, how unprepared we are to hearing these kind things from each other. So remember that building other people's up, giving them the attaboy, talking about them at leadership meetings, you're showing how great of a leader you are and that you are secure in yourself enough to praise others. So recognizing healthy and unhealthy competition. Competition is healthy and natural. It can quickly become unhealthy. But let's think about women who have been on athletic teams growing up, or maybe debate teams growing up, where you had to contribute as an individual, but what you really wanted was for the team to shine. 
in all of the studies they did, women who had been um, had been involved in healthy competition growing up did much better in championing other women. So think about how you could be possibly experiencing negative interactions with other women in your professional setting. Um, we don't all get along with everyone. Nobody does. There's nothing wrong with that. We're not all each other's person. But what is important is to stop and think about why am I having that reaction to that person? It could be that they're just not your person. Like you just don't jive. I've had women in my life where we just don't jive. Um, and that's okay. We don't have to all get along, but it's important to gut check to understand, do we just not jive because our personalities are so very different? Or do we not jive because I have some jealousy that I'm not thinking about? I have some envy. Um, remember that hurt people hurt people. And so if I'm feeling at my weakest state, then I may want to come out swinging a little bit more. That's unhealthy competition. So how can I really analyze what my reaction is to understand, is it a bias, an unconscious bias, or is it uh, coming from a place of insecurity? What are the deeper reasons for why I'm competing with another woman in my workplace? Do you cheer when there's women around you getting promotions? Or is your first instinct to think, why didn't I get it? Celebrate promotions. What can I do better to support hiring and promotion of women in my role? And so when you think about your role in a company and how you can help others get promoted, it takes away that unhealthy competition because Deep down, we do want to help others. We are good people at our core. We've just got to get through some of the language that's been taught to us. This is a good one. How many micro affirmations do you give to women in your professional circle in a week, in a month? A micro affirmation is giving someone supportive comments, broadcasting their good work, supporting them in other ways, these are small acts that can be done privately or publicly, uh, but just start counting how many you actually do. And then the other one is we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Even a little snark can do a lot of damage. If you notice that there is somebody who comes to you with a little bit of insecurity, instead of um, repeating that insecurity to them, hold back any kind of comments, any kind of snark, and just focus on building them up. Here is one that I have to, um, I was saying earlier before we got on that when I was putting this together, I was thinking through my behaviors and what I do. Um, Cause remember I failed the bias test. So clearly I'm not doing everything right, but what, what could I really work on more? And this one really surprised me. Um, it was prioritizing relationship building. I feel like I've got a lot of friends. I feel like I get along really well with everybody at work and then um, out in the community. But what I don't do is prioritize getting together because we are doing a thousand things. Many of us have what's called the second shift, right? Like we work, we go home, we're taking care of a loved one, be it children, parents, another family member, um, but that's hurting us. We need to stand closer together. So there's a personal story where um, there's a group of entrepreneurs in town that are men and they, um, they were getting together uh, very often it was unofficial. They met monthly. It was the founders of companies that have had multiple exits. It was founders who were retired and founders who were just starting out. It was not a formal meetup. They were just kind of hanging out like men. But I can tell you that the founders that are starting out in business are significantly benefiting from being in the room with those experienced founders. And then the men who have had the exits who have retired are also hearing about great business opportunities that women are not because we are not in that room. 
And so I talked with somebody in the community about, this is really disappointing to me. I know I, I'm not going to get in that room. They're having like, they're, you know, they're just doing their thing. It's not ill-intentioned, but why don't we have women's founders coming together to meet up and, and share what we're going through, talk about things that we've done well, where we're really just need some more support ecosystems. And we kicked it off monthly. And I think we're probably having the fourth one. And the first one was very well attended and attendance has already started dropping significantly. And it's because we are so busy. There was one, the last one where I was like, I really do not need to take the time to do this meeting, but I cannot start complaining about men having more advantages and more communication of getting insight about what it takes to build a great company if I'm not going to do the footwork to get myself um, in situations to do this. So it's holding us back. If we showed commitment to it, we would be able to draw in more and more women, more of the, the women who have been so successful in our community, and they could start bringing more input and value as well. I am absolutely not talking about a networking group. I'm talking about a group of people who get together, they get vulnerable, they ask for help, and they carry each other through. We have got to find the time. And they call it, there's a study um, from the Harvard Business Re Review, um, and they call it finding your squad. So to get guidance on overcoming these hurdles, we need to firm close connections with other women who can share experiences from other women that they've learned from and where they have been. This is question like, how do you get, how did you get on the leadership team? What projects should I sign up for? In the book that I mentioned earlier, The Exceptions, they only started realizing that their labs were off-sized because they started talking to each other. And it's not like there's a ton of women to talk to about being a scientist, right? At MIT in the 70s, but it took them finding the time to come together in a collaborative way to realize that they were being treated differently. One woman, in fact, one of the scientists had this groundbreaking research. They wanted to present it. She had a male partner and the, her boss said, you can't be part of that presentation of this project, of the success of this study, because we need it to be taken seriously. And if there's a woman co-presenting, they won't take it seriously. And she actually said, oh, you're right. I shouldn't present. And the, t the other women in the room were like, that's not right. They helped her realize what she was thinking about. So this research in the Harvard Business Review found that while both men and women benefit from having a network of well-connected peers across different groups, women who have an inner circle, a squad of close female contacts are much more likely to land executive positions and higher pay. There was no link found for the success of men if they had an inner circle because they've already kind of got that group advice. They've already got the input that they need to succeed. So we need to have our great community that we have, but also find your mini squad uh, and tap into them. Who would be your go-to group of girls if you had an emergency, needed honest advice, wanted a key business introduction, when it comes to building relationships, you, you get back what you give. We all know that. My squad is so important for me and my career and my well-being. Um, one woman, Brittany Somerville, she probably single-handedly helped my company survive when COVID happened by making one random connection. She put me in one room um, for Birmingham Strong that was starting to come together and sponsored me there and it ended up into a contract that really just held us, kept us alive until people started hiring again and some of the shock of COVID fell off. So my squad really supports each other. We tell each other the hard truths. So we don't, um, part of being a strong squad is that you don't only say the good things. You need to have the honest conversations about behaviors that could be holding us back. 
and about um, maybe being too shy and forcing ourselves to, to get out there. Um, and we need to act as connections to people and opportunities. I, I probably two years ago, somebody told me never turn down a meeting. I am a single mom. I've got two kids. I'm starting my own business. I do not have the time, but I took that to heart. And I have, if somebody asks for a meeting, I never turn it down because it seems to always turn into something where I can help somebody else by getting them in front of a peer, or I can share that connection at a later date. It's exhausting. There's, I've met some incredible people from it. There've been some great opportunities, but this is one I really want to hit hard on. Clearly I'm spending the most time on this one. So whenever one of us comes across a great opportunity, we need to immediately send it to each other. It's amazing, but the best feeling to be part of a group of women who want you to be at your very best and actively help you succeed. And so I am going to go back to this slide so that we really focus on make the unconscious conscious, things that we don't realize that are happening. We need to make sure that everybody is aware about it. There are ways to do this that are jokey. There are ways to do this that are direct. And mostly it involves finding the people in the room who are willing to hear it. Manage how others view you and how you view yourself. Do you view yourself with pride? Do you view yourself with confidence? Do you feel like you've earned the right to be at the table? And then you will have that confidence to share it with others, to bring others along with you. Instead of saying something potentially negative, just a small little remark about a female who's in leadership or maybe less senior, um, you will want to bring them up. Find an ally, be an ally. It is much easier to be an ally too when you've got an ally that is at a higher level than you. So maybe prioritize finding somebody who is either your peer or maybe a level higher to be that ally. And then you can start pulling people up. That is the um, carry as you climb mantra is all of us are just kind of pulling each other up a mountain. Think about the momentum mountain. Um, recognize healthy versus unhealthy competition. Think about being on a uh, uh, athletic team. You are all trying to win state. You are all trying to win the Olympics. And you are all trying to make sure that you are the best version of yourselves. I think we saw a lot of this while looking at women's soccer this year of how not only did they so much support each other, but they had massive impact on women's pay across the athletic programs and also for um, when they become parents, parental leave. And then prioritize relationship building. We are busy. All of us have a lot to do, especially as we become um, more senior. There's even more on our plate and a lot more people trying to get our attention. Make sure that you prioritize finding your squad supporting them as well as using them to be vulnerable and support yourself. And so overall, we need more women supporting women. This is no longer a zero sum game. We can lift each other up and still be lifted ourselves. As more women move into leadership roles and provide opportunities for other women to thrive, companies benefit significantly. This is also not a men against women because that's that's not really where the behavior change is and that's not necessarily where the behavior problems lie. It is that men were able to get together as a group and get elevated. Women now need to do that same thing. We need to come together as a group and start elevating each other. We can start this in Birmingham um, we can reverse stereotypes that women don't support other women. I'd love to not see any more mean girl movies, uh, that typical trope of somebody trying to tear a group of girls down. Uh, there's research that shows that women in particular benefit from collaboration over competition, but from such a young age in magazines, on social media, we are taught to compare ourselves to the other woman. There's a way to do that healthy. 
in a very healthy concept. And then there's a way to do that where um, it becomes negative. So women who support women, there's tons of studies, are the most successful in business. And the way for us to all have more than 10% companies with a female CEO is if we can support each other. And so I went through this faster than I actually, than I had intended, but we did talk about, I would love to have open conversation about women are experiencing. If you think that I got things wrong here that we can, um, we can correct your opinions from your experiences or other ways that can support each other, I would love for that to happen. And so I can stop screen sharing as we go through the chats. Delphine, I'd like to just go ahead and say this up front. Thank you for everything that you've shared because I was looking through um, several articles uh, leading up to this when women are treated um, unfair in the workplace, it also bleeds into other aspects of your life of where it is a huge differentiation of responsibilities, expectations, even um, valuing. And I feel like that it's not just the workplace. And as, as women helping us support each other in the workplace, it will bleed over into improving all the other areas. Um. It bleeds into church even, right? Like, yes, there are a lot of churches where we're trying to grow female leadership beyond mm -hmm. the childcare areas. Mm -hmm. And so we can all support each other there. Um, it very much bleeds into our community relations, how you get along with the other moms on the soccer team, the cheer team, mm -hmm. um, instead of comparing your daughters against each other. That's, I think, the next gen the next thing that happens when you become a parent is you start comparing your kids um, it's this, it's this comparison that we got stuck in because early on, that was our way of surviving, making sure that we were in a better position because we didn't have control of everything that was around us. Um, the bias test, I'll go find where that link was. They did, uh, it had six bias tests. It was about age discrimination, color discrimination, um, gender discrimination, LGBTQ. It was really a very interesting site. And I was blowing through it thinking like, this is going to be awesome. I'm doing so good. And it was a hundred percent not good. Um, and it was very enlightening to me. And I think, I think we should all own it that, that we're not getting it right, that we, that we're failing it. Um, because acknowledging it is how we can change. Delphine, Tina had put the test in the uh -huh. um, the uh, in the chat for us, and I was kind of looking over that a little bit too. And yes, uh, that's going to be something I want. I definitely will be doing and passing along for my friends to take a look at because you're right. We think that we are doing great until we see there's so many ways we can improve. So thank you for sharing that. Kara, you you said it's so true about women's accomplishments versus their potential. So 2% of venture capital, all the venture capital dollars, the billions that are out there, only 2% go to women's founders. But of the 65% um, of the companies that have venture funding that have a women leader do better than a single male leader. And so they know the accomplishments are there. There is data to show that women bring a lot of value to leadership tables, but we still have to prove um, that we belong there. And Kate, tell me more if you can. You say that it seems like color should also be bolded on this page. Oh, the, the treating women of color. I see what you mean, the 30 traits that are affecting women. Um, I, I would, you know, yes, I was thinking about many males that still struggle in the workplace who are men of color, um, but yeah, it probably should be bolded. Um, the stats do show that women of color are fall further behind in almost all metrics than men of color. Um, so I will change that if I ever do this presentation again. Um, Tina, I heard a hiring manager, you said uh, that had a practice to give more money to give new to new fathers because they now need to provide for their families. Um, we end up losing money. In fact, the gender pay divide is greater between 
mothers and non-mothers than men and women. So it's truly the fact that once we start having children, which our communities actually need us to do this, um, that's, that's when we start getting dinged. Um, I actually experienced this myself at one of my companies. I was part of the leadership table and somebody was talking about it. And I look back on this with a lot of shame. It was younger in my career and I didn't call it out. And, and to me, I had grown up with a stay-at-home mom. That was one of the things that that test showed is that I had some bias about it. Um, and to this day, I have so much shame. This is probably 20 years ago. I have so much shame about that moment that I didn't say something. Brittany Somerville, to highlight her, she was my team lead at Daxco and she championed our salaries like no one I've ever seen. She made sure that all of the females on our team were paid equal to the men that were there. And that was a big risk for her, right? She was held to a budget just like all of us are. And so it behooved her to hold back on that budget so she'd save her money and be able to do other things, but she stood tall and did what was right. Um, that book, I so badly want to read that book, The Exceptions. It, it's come out recently. And if you want to listen to the interview, um, it's on NPR and it's incredibly good. Yeah, um, the, the link I put in is the NPR link because that's what I heard as well earlier this, I guess it was just a few days ago, I think, wasn't it? That's it, that's it. Um, um, RAP, although I'm just gonna call you RAP because that's a lot more fun. Uh, can you expand on two points? First, how to use this in hiring. Second, how do you educate and socialize in this workplace? Okay, how to use this in hiring is a big one, especially in the world that we live in. We've seen this to where the hiring managers say, sorry, that, Talent acquisition team, which we saw with 70.3 women, they say they are taking orders from the hiring managers. And I know that's a very difficult position when you're in the HR department, you're in recruiting talent acquisition, but it's even more important for women at that stage to start highlighting the great things that they see in a resume. So one of the things that we started doing with companies early on is we asked them to articulate, especially with our mothers who'd been out of the workforce, we asked them to articulate what they saw was a great fit. We don't ask what's not a fit. We want them to convince themselves that this person is a fit. And so I think probably a whole nother presentation by some HR specialists could be how do HR leaders guide hiring managers? So the person who the team, the person's gonna actually work on into thinking more inclusively so that we can hit some of our um, inclusion metrics. But it's um, that HR team really needs to start being the boots on the ground champion. And educating and socializing this in the workplace, it's truly finding the allies there is a story um, about Melinda Gates where she talked about finding one person in each room that she would watch during a meeting and she would tap as an ally and then she would pursue that relationship and grow that relationship. And so educating other women about their behavior, I'll send you this deck and you can deliver it. But as far as getting the allies to bring you up, it's looking in every meeting, who is my ally in this situation? Um, I would just say on that, you said the deck, but this, um, we are recording and this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll have a chance to go back and review it. And there may be some women around you or other team members, men as well, that you may want to sit down with and, and watch this whole conversation. Um, with them at some another future point. Um, so Elena, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You talked about number three is tough due to people pleasing techniques, which is turning down work. That's not your wheelhouse. I am a five on the Enneagram. I don't know if you guys have done the Enneagram. So I'm a little bit like robotic and um, I've never wanted to do something that I knew I would fail at. Truly event planning is my my nemesis. I can't stand doing it. I'm not good at it. There's so much detail. I'm not very good with this fine detail. And so just very clearly say, I'm not the right person for this. 
but I know somebody else would. Now let's not throw another woman under the bus if that's the go-to, but we can start thinking about men who are very gregarious and probably would be great at event planning and adding it to their plate. But, but at, there are certain business sizes where I'm going to have to make the coffee some mornings if I'm the first person at the pot. Do you have to clean up that coffee or clean up the conference room after everybody leaves? Are you the person pushing in all the seats? It does look better, but what about if you said, hey guys, help me for a second, push all these chairs back in so we don't leave the room looking like a mess. We're leaders or we're something. Let's represent the team. And so trying to involve everybody uh, for better, for worse, my crutch has always been humor to try and get people to, to join in and it seems to diffuse it. Um, again, it's a crutch, right? Like I should just be bold in saying it, but I was born in 1973. Um, you, uh, Amelia, you talked about, I need to say yes, because this person thought I'd be a good fit and I don't want to disappoint them or cause them not to think of me down the road. So potentially, let's say they said you'd be a great fit for uh, presenting about um, the, you know, a new customer success model. Customer success isn't potentially your thing, but there's another person who's great at it, or even better, if there's another woman about it, say, my expertise is data. I can tear into a, pres a spreadsheet and a pivot table. I would love to do a presentation on how to use Excel better, but I think this one is really much better suited for some for somebody else. It's all how you position the no. If you just say no, I'm overwhelmed, or no, I don't have the time, or just no, I'm not good at it, then that's that's a full stop in their brain. And so helping them understand, oh, this is when I can use her skills and her talents, because we've all got things that we're amazing at. We're not very good at acknowledging that we're amazing at them, and maybe that's a start too is being confident about what we're good at. Um, Kara, motherhood teaches us so many qualities that apply to the corporate world. Bright Horizons does a longitudinal study, which is like the top tier of how studies are done. And every single time it talks about women leaders, um, feedback from employees shows that they have stronger leadership skills, more empathy during COVID that was uh, very much relied on a lot of the female leaders because of how much empathy we had, ability to shift, ability to pivot. Uh, there's a lot that motherhood kind of puts us into more than it takes away from us. And Lavinia, how do you recommend opening up a candid conversation with a female he peer who you suspect, suspect might hold some bias against females and exhibits exhibit its in our day-to-day -day interactions with other females. Man, that is a tough one. I'm this is so stupid, but I'm actually working on that with my 13-year-old right now and I, I'm thinking through when there is somebody who is so uh you can tell that is visibly how do you diffuse that? How do you minimize that? Um I don't know if it's if for example if Tina says, boy, Delphine, she leaves at 445 every day because she's a mom and she's just not dedicated. If you can maybe say, oh man, I know Delphine, she goes home and she works. I don't know if it's redirecting the comments so that again, the last thing that people hear is not her language and she starts learning about what good looks like. Uh, does anybody else have any ideas for this one of how to diffuse somebody who's showing this bad, the negative? Maybe that's, you know, something that we can all talk about and, and share at one point in our, in our pods. I like, <laughs> yes, I like the um, redirecting or, um, and you had it on one of your slides, I think, Delphine, about, um, being positive about other other women around you and you know bringing them up so that people you know you you do want your peers or the peers and um, around you to hear the positive side of that of, you know Delphine leaving early or whatever whatever that may be and you know she's still pulling her weight and she made the highest money on the whatever project or you know things like that you know when we keep those positive mm -hmm. images flowing at the top of everyone's 
uh, what everyone's hearing. Um, so any thoughts about bringing more women in virtual settings into the conversation? Nobody's going to like this, but we've got to turn our cameras on. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and I'm not saying in this situation it's perfectly appropriate, but I'm talking about in meetings where decisions are being made. It is tough for us as women to look at ourselves for that long every single day. There was a study early on in COVID that said that humans were not built for that much self um like looking at yourself for that long and feedback, that much of a, of a tight feedback loop. So it is tough. Turn off your personal screen, whatever you have to do, but your face needs to be present. People read your, be animated. They read your instructions. Like if there's something good in a meeting, I'll start cheering like this. You've just got to make your personality bigger to stand out. Call on other women first. Close the meeting with a, a woman's comment. Don't, if somebody is interrupted, so Liz Wilson starts talking, Michael, anybody really starts talking over Liz, then let him say his thing, let her say her thing, and then bring it back to Liz. And so redirect it back so that they don't get stomped on um, verbally. Um... I've spoken, <laughs> Tiffany, this breaks my heart. I've spoken to women in leadership that have stated that they lost a promotion due to being a single divorced parent. However, men were given the promotion with new babies. In my opinion, a parent has better management skills um, since we have schedules entire family. So how is it that we can't manage a team? I think it's because the assumption is, is that men are less involved and women have to take time out to be more involved. So April Benatola is actually the one who like made me start thinking about this super early on was until we can get men equally involved in parenting, we will not have that time at the table. So we've got to normalize a man taking his kids to the doctor, males or a man taking um, paternity leave and not thinking, why is he taking paternity leave? We've got to normalize them leaving early to coach their kids games once that changes at the higher level, it's so much better. I know I keep saying a study, but I love studies. So another study came out that 3% of Gen Zs change, um, have never changed a kid's diaper versus uh, what is mine? What is my generation above millennials? 75% uh, had never changed a kid's diaper. So it's changing. We need to allow those dads to really be the dads that they want to be. And then we'll be able to show, hey, everybody's got these parenting responsibilities. So don't take $8,000 away from me because I just had a kid. Okay, we've got two more minutes. I'll let y'all close it out. Thank you for all the great comments and for being so engaged. Thank you so very much, um, Delphine, for everything. Oh my gosh, great conversation. Thank you, everyone who has been leaving comments. Um, as Tina has said, we will have, this is recorded, it will be on our, our website. And we'd love to have you come back and look at this some more, Delphine. We have also posted your, the link to your website so they can look more um, into what you're doing. We wanna thank our sponsors. Um, without them, this would not be able to, exist. And we want to thank our sponsors so very much for not just supporting us, but supporting women and encouraging us and, and everything that we do. Um, if y'all would take a look at the announcements, this is our um, open enrollment right now for our early um, career, which is our upward. And we would love to have you come on in and take a look at us and start applying. Um, and also, um, and our mentor, uh, Mentorship is is something that we're really, uh, that's my heart, because I believe it's a stepping stone of women getting in there, getting to know each other, developing these relationships so we can't bring each other to the table. So go to our website and take a look at how you can be a mentor. And if you're looking for a mentor, we have wonderful resources right there. Um, and then our next um, webinar is going to be on September 21st with Miss Gail Lance. Looking forward to having her on there too. Um, thank you all for everyone 
being here and sharing the space with us and listening to Delphine. Delphine, thank you for everything you have poured into us and encouraged us. Like I said, this information was great. Everyone is just pouring out some great accolades to you and, uh, and appreciate how you've empowered us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. This was fun. It was. <laughs> we will see you all later. Thank you and look forward to having y'all a part of us at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thanks for taking the time to invest in yourself by watching our webinar. This series is produced in partnership with Social U. Many thanks to our sponsor companies, including America's Thrift Stores, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, Protective Life, and Regions Bank. A full list of Momentum sponsors is online at MomentumLeaders.org slash sponsors. Beyond this webinar, we have a lot of ways for you to get more momentum in your life. Check out the show notes for additional links and resources.